several people uh, say to me, I, I submitted a question for your uh, arts vote uh, session, so I, I hope they will ask you my question. <laughs> well, we will do our best. We definitely um, keep track of those as they're submitted and pull them over. All right, y'all, I'm recording, so we can go ahead and start. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm James McKissick, the um, president of Arts Build, and we're excited to have everyone with us today for our uh, candidate chat with uh, candidate Monty Brule. Um, Arts Build, as you know, our mission is building community through the arts. Um, we do that by funding arts organizations and arts projects. Um, we're an advocate for the arts, a convener and an arts hub in Hamilton County. Um, I want to thank our uh, coordinator of this, uh, Monica Kinsey, um, who worked with us uh, uh, on behalf of Arts Forward to organize this series, which is a wonderful gift to our arts sector, but also to the community at large. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to her and she's going to introduce our candidate and our moderator and um, take it from there. Thank you, James. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate your attendance. Um, Arts Forward, if you're not familiar, is a collective of 18 nonprofits here in town that I've been working with for the past year and a unofficial uh, arm or partner with Arts Build to help continue their mission. So I really appreciate your attendance. As we all know, the arts are so important um, and heavily relied on this, in this year and these times, but also unfortunately underserved. And so, of course, we want to get our arts community more engaged with our local candidates and our local elections, um, and also to get our candidates to know more about our arts community and how strong and resilient they are and what they provide to our community and how they serve. So I'd like to welcome, of course, Ms. Edna Varner as our moderator today. We are so thrilled to have her uh, and fortunate. Um, and also our candidate today for our Lunch and Learn is Mr. Monty Brule. Let's uh, go ahead and I'll, Edna, I'll let you take this off. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much uh, for your part in making this happen. Uh, I'm excited to be here for two reasons. One is I am a member of the Arts Bill Board. And the other is Monty Brule and I, uh, I think the best way to describe our connection is we go way back. And whenever I'm in a community <laughs> meeting, uh, you're also in that community meeting. I've heard people say you're everywhere. And I say, uh, you must be everywhere too. So I know a lot about you, but there may be people on this call who don't know you as well as I do. So let's get started with this question. Tell us a little about your background and in particular, your experiences with the arts. Okay, well, first of all, let me thank uh, Arts Build and, and Arts Forward for, for putting this together and extending this opportunity to me. Um, I, I love engaging with people, uh, in particular the, the arts community. Sometimes we hear people say that there are two Chattanoogas. Well, I like to joke that there are also two Monte Brules. Uh, a, a, a lot of people can tell you that I am the first African American graduate of Baylor, and that from Baylor I went to Harvard, and then maybe even after Harvard that I, you know, worked in Coca-Cola bottling and. And, and went on to, 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 to several other uh, uh, great corporate positions. But people may not know that I am a kid who grew up poor in Alton Park, I lived on Highland Avenue, just up the street from Union Grove Baptist Church, that I lived in East Chattanooga in City View Apartments, uh, apartment F5, and that uh, it, it's really just through a stroke of luck and the grace of God that, uh, that I got to go to Baylor and, and, and to Harvard and, and those other things. Um, but I like, to, I like to say that, that if I'm the next mayor of Chattanooga, I won't have to hire a consultant to tell me about struggle or about poverty. I won't have to commission a, a study. Uh, I know from personal experience, that's, that's my life. And I think I'm one of the few candidates who knows Chattanooga from every neighborhood, from every nook and cranny. 
uh, because I have, I have been in all of those neighborhoods. What I love about the arts community is that, uh, you know, art just isn't an expression of, of our current condition. It's, it's a, a representation and it, it's an expression of our hopes and dreams. Um, when I think about art, I'm very optimistic um, because, you know, when you're, when you're growing up in a low income neighborhood and all you have are your, you know, your crayons or some chalk or, or, or what have you, you can create a world, uh, any world that you want. And, and, and so uh, art is a great place to, to, to go and, it's, and, and every community you know, has, has creatives. That's one of the things I like about art because no matter whether you are living in, in Alton Park or Normal Park, you know, there are creatives in your, in your neighborhood and, and it's a great uh, way to inspire the people uh, throughout the entire city. Uh, the, the last thing that, that I want to say about the arts is that um, people think of it sometimes as just a pretty thing or, or a, a nice hobby to have. But, you know, there are over 7,000 people in Chattanooga who derive their living in some way from the arts community. Now, if you add Chattanooga city government and Hamilton County government together, you would have right at 7,000 jobs. So that's how our, our economy believe that the contribution to our economy is somewhere north of $170 million a year. So the arts are, it's big business in Chattanooga. And uh, I, I think that we, we need to focus more uh, on the arts because it can be an incredible driver in so many ways. Thank, thank you for that. And we're, we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. I remember, uh, I, I think I first developed my love of the arts uh, in the ukulele band in elementary school. My parents sacrificed, I grew up poor too. My parents sacrificed $5 to uh, buy me a ukulele. Talk a little more, uh, talk personally about uh, your uh, introduction to the arts, your personal engagement in the arts. Well, I wish I could tell you that, that I was a talented person myself, but, but I think what the teachers used to say about me is that I was a kid who couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler. So uh, I, I don't have that, that story to tell. Um, I, I think that the, the, my first experience with the arts was probably um, as a student at Calvin Donaldson Elementary when we would go on field trips. And, uh, and I would get, get to go to museums and, and places that I had never been before. Uh, and, and, and so from that, that time, the, the arts have always been important to me. Um, you know, I've been involved uh, over the years with the Hunter Museum. Uh, I, I, I'm a former board chair of uh, Glasshouse Collective. And, uh, and, and so we work with a lot of creatives in East Chattanooga to, uh, to, to bring inspiration and hope and optimism to, uh, to those neighborhoods as, as well. Uh, and if you, uh, uh, if, if you happen to, to, to be in my home, uh, you can tell that uh, I'm still a lover of, of, of the arts because uh, uh, I think uh, just about every uh, square inch of the wall space is, uh, is covered in stone. Uh, one of um, something that has been commonly said is that the arts can be a solution uh, for some of the problems we're having with young people. Talk, uh, talk a little about how the arts might be uh, that connection to something more positive than what we're seeing happening with young people? And, and how might we infuse arts more in, for example, our youth development centers? Sure, I think the first thing that we have to do is talk about what the definition of art is. Uh, I, I think that we've got to be much more expansive and much more inclusive. And if we really want to involve young people in the arts, instead of uh, having you know, old people you know, like me 
define what that is, we've got to be open to, to new expression and, and, and to have young people bring uh, new art forms to the table. Um, you know, for example, a lot of times we forget about uh, the performing arts. Uh, I, I think that we've got to do much more uh, as a city to, to include all aspects of performing uh, arts. And, and, and that can be anything from, uh, you know, hip hop to, to dance. Uh, there's, there's just so many things that, that are out there. So you ask about the YFD centers in particular. Uh, I think that we don't really utilize the YFD centers and, uh, to their, uh, their full potential. Nothing breaks my heart more than to drive by one of those buildings on a sunny summer uh, day and to, to see it closed. Uh, there are no kids there. There are no kids that are, that are enjoying it. Um, YFD has to be an expression of community. And we've fallen into the, the trap of trying to build cookie cutter facilities so that, you know, uh, Avondale gets this facility. Well, then, you know, another wants the exact same facility. And, and we don't need to, to, to create carbon copies of, of these buildings. Um, we need to have YFD centers that embrace the cultures of the neighborhoods uh, that they inhabit. And, uh, and, and, and we, we need to really look at the supplement from the arts to, uh, to the outdoors in terms of, of how we manage those centers. I know, for example, um, the city of Chattanooga gives about $250,000 a year to Arts Bill to, uh, uh, to, to manage programs in, in neighborhoods. And, and I've already said this to James in the past, you know, we need to at least double that. Uh, we're, we're not investing uh, enough in the arts and we're not investing enough in the arts through the YFD centers. Thank you. You've obviously done your homework on the uh, impact of the arts on the city beyond a great Saturday night. There are so many priorities. How um, can a mayor protect the arts when all of these other priorities are bubbling up so talk to us about protecting the arts as a priority. Sure. We have in Chattanooga what is called a strong mayor form of government. Uh, it's our mayor that, that sets our budget and that, that budget then goes to city council and is, is approved by city council. But the budget is an expression of a mayor's priorities and values. And you really want to make sure that when you elect a person to that office, that you're voting for someone who, who shares your priorities and, and your values. Um, there are so many things that, that we can do to support the arts and to protect the arts. But one of the, uh, well, I'll just one is every time someone purchases a ticket to any event or, or, or a venue here in Chattanooga, I want to uh, give that person the option of contributing a dollar to the arts. Now imagine if every time you, 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 you went to Memorial Auditorium or you went to uh, a football game, I mean, anything, if someone said, hey, will you add a dollar uh, for for the arts here, uh, I think many people would would willingly uh, contribute an extra dollar, and those dollars add up. And and so by creating that kind of fund, I believe that that we can uh, better protect and better invest in the in the arts because we've got to show local artists uh, that uh, uh, they can make a living as, as as an artist. It's it's not just about your talent; it's about how you feed your family as well. And the, the, the last thing that I, that I wanna talk about is there are cities across this country that have what they call a percent for the arts program, where anytime you've got a major development, a major construction a project, by, by law, um, up, up to 1% of the value of that development is invested in the arts. And you know we do a version of that here in Chattanooga, 
Um, we, we fund public art through the city's capital budget, but I would really like to see something established, uh, like a 1% for the arts program. Um, so when I talk about all of these things that I'm going to do, I'm not talking about taking things from the existing city budget as it as it is today. Um, we've got to be creative and, and there are innovative funding mechanisms like those two that I've just mentioned that don't cost taxpayers a single cent. It's, it's really new money that we're bringing into the system and that's what's gonna be required to protect, promote uh, and, and support the arts. Awesome. I think great leaders uh, become greater when they surround themselves uh, with the right people. So you've already put a couple of innovative ideas out there on the table. Who are the people that you will call on for your inner circle uh, to advance the arts as mayor? Wow. Well, I think I'm looking at three of them on this, uh, on, on this call right now. So this is this is a good place to start. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people about what it takes to be a successful mayor. And one of the, the people I've talked to is Bob Corker, who I think was a great mayor uh, for Chattanooga. And Bob said to me, the most important power that a mayor has is the power to convene, the power to bring people around the table. And then once you have convened, these people, you have got to put your e. You've you've got to give other people the credit, and you've got to support the good work of these smart people that you brought together. And so that's what I want to do in many aspects of this community. And that really is is how I would describe my leadership. But it's particularly true in the in in the arts community. Uh, I, I want to convene a summit of, of leaders in the arts community. Uh, it, I, do, I get frustrated sometimes because in Chattanooga, we seem to think that we can accomplish things by having small meetings with the same smart people. And we've got to be much more expansive in our thinking. So when I say I want to convene a summit in the arts community, I want to bring artists from all over the community, uh, not just from the Hunter Museum, but for but somebody who's you know painting in a garage studio, um, I want to hear all of those voices. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, way back when in the uh, uh, in the mid 1980s and into the 90s when we had Chattanooga Venture and uh, the Vision 2000 process. But you know I was chairman of the board of uh, of Chattanooga Venture, and and I believe that we need to to have more of that collaboration. So, so when, I, when I think about the arts, I think about really having a meeting with, you know, a hundred people or more coming together who, who know the arts intimately and, and let's create an agenda, an arts agenda for Chattanooga. Uh, we're, we, we've got to give power back to the people and, and that's, that's true in the arts and it's true everywhere else. Uh, we've got to be more inclusive and more expansive. And, uh, and I think the arts can show leadership here. Well, you just mentioned being more inclusive. When you started, you were talking about two Chattanoogas. And sometimes when people talk about two Chattanoogas, they talk about the racial divide. Talk to us about how you will be more inclusive, especially of artists of color. Well, I want to say, first of all, yes, the city needs to uh, be a part of the solution to providing more equity uh, in the arts and, and other facets of, of our everyday uh, lives. But I also want to be clear that this lack of equity, this, in fact, this inequity that exists was not created by city government. It was created by all of us and our personal behaviors because we make choices every day. And if we all decided that we were going to buy a work of art from uh, uh, a person of, of color, then, then, then we would 
be erasing those inequities that exist. So, so while the city is going to show leadership, and, and, and I can talk about some, it really comes down to our, our personal behavior too. We all have to do our part to, uh, to get rid of uh, inequity wherever we see it. Now, having said that, I've already talked about how I'm going, I'm going to add funding mechanisms to uh, the arts community. Well, now that we have that additional money, we've got to uh, commission local artists to provide public art. Uh, we've, we've got to make sure that there are galleries in different neighborhoods. I, I would love for there to be an Alton Park gallery that showcased the talents of, of people who, who were from that community, who lived in that community. Imagine if, you know, on Glass Street in East Chattanooga, if we created an art gallery that, that featured the works of, of people in, in that community. So, so I think that the city has a role to, to play there. Uh, we, we as a city own lots of um, uh, buildings space that's not really used for anything uh, right now. And, and, and we could convert uh, uh, those spaces to incredible uh, uh, spaces for artists and, and, and for gallery space too. You referenced uh, the arts impact uh, on the economy earlier, and I promised we'd get back to it. Tell us how you would speak to those who say it's all about the economy. And I, I don't see how arts can help us boost the economy. How do you speak back to that? You you, you broke up a little bit there, Edna, but I, I think I got the, the just. Little. Yeah, talk about uh, how you would talk to this community that may not believe yet how important an impact the arts can have on the economy. Well, the, the first thing that I would say is if you see the joy on any child's face when they are coloring or drawing or playing with uh, clay or you know, doing, doing anything, Imagine if we could sustain that level of joy throughout that child's entire life. Um, so I think that the, the, the arts first and foremost are a foundation for inspiration, a foundation for joy. So whether you are an artist or not, I think you can be positively impacted by the arts. Now, now, having said that in general, let's talk specifically uh, 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 about the, the arts. Um, I said earlier that we need to expand our definition of what art is. And, and in this time where technology is changing almost on a daily basis, I believe that the arts are a portal to creative work, to creative process. So um, I, I think the more people that you can involve in the, in the arts, you're really adding to their earnings potential because you're, you're making them part of our creative economy. Uh, and, then, and the third thing is, you know, we've already mentioned that the arts contribute over $170 million to our economy right now. Um, but there are cities, you know, let's, let's just go up the road to Asheville, uh, where they have invested in creating an arts district and, and, a, and an arts uh, ecosystem, if you, if you will. And I think that Chattanooga needs to do more of that, um, because we could become a destination uh, for the arts in the southeast. I mean, given where we're located, we're, we're equidistant between Atlanta, Nashville, Knoxville, Birmingham. Um, I, I, I think that, that as a city, we need to look at the arts as an economic development opportunity, which it is. And, and, and that is, is how we're really going to, uh, to, to drive this. Because when we build the economy, you know, we're adding to our tax base, we're adding to 
um, uh, the ability to, to invest in neighborhoods and communities all throughout our city. And, and so I, I think the arts as an economic development tool should, should really get its due. And I don't think it's gotten its due in Chattanooga to this point. Well, we appreciate, we appreciate that. We're going to be going to the chat box soon to get more questions, but I'll just give you this one more. So often we are frustrated by problems we see that could easily be addressed. So I'm going to loosen the reins a little. You can reference the arts, but you can go beyond the arts. What's a problem that frustrates you that we, sh we should be able to easily address? Well, I'm frustrated by the two Chattanoogas. Um, on one hand, there are people who are doing quite well, uh, but we're also leaving people behind. We have a child poverty rate of 35% in Chattanooga. So one in three of our children lives in poverty. It, when you look at households in poverty, two thirds of those households are uh, are headed by single women. And quite frankly, uh, the reason that we uh, have not done anything to, to lift people out of poverty is that we've not had a mayor who had it as a priority. Um, we've, we keep electing the same type of person uh, over and, and over again and expecting a different result. And all we get is the same poor outcome for so many people in our community really, really frustrates me. If we go back to 19 when John Kinsey was elected mayor of Nuga, and I think he was the first of what I will call a series of progressive mayors that, that, that we've had, the average African-American household earned 62% of what the average white household earns. Well, now here we are in 2020, almost 2021, and you would think after all all of these years of progress that we would have improved those numbers. Well, pre-COVID in Chattanooga, the average African-American household earned half what the average white household earned. So we're headed in the wrong direction. Um, I like to say that Chattanooga is like a brand new shiny pickup truck. And some of us are riding up front in the, in the cab with the air conditioning on and the music blaring. And we're looking out at the beautiful vista through the windshield. And we're not even paying attention to the people who are trapped in the bed of the truck exposed to the elements. And we keep adding more and more people to the bed of that truck. And when the, the thing about that truck is at some point, the weight in the bed is going to exceed the capacity of, of that truck. And it's not just the people in the back who are going to be broken down by the side of the road. We're all going to be broken down by the side of the road. And we need to wake up. We need to to start doing things differently. And, and, and we, we need to quit looking at, at poverty, at, at crime, at a lack of affordable housing, all of those things is somebody else's problem. Well, <laughs> I've got news for you. It's everybody's problem. And we've got to come together and solve those problems. Um, we need progress, not just for the few. We need progress for every single citizen of Chattanooga. And, and so you want to know what frustrates me? Those are the things that, 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 one, frustrate me, but they also make me so excited about possibly being the next mayor of Chattanooga because, you know, I want to get up every single day. I want to be out in the, in the community. I, you know, Edna, you may have heard me talk about this, but, but I want to do a mayor's day out where I take my whole executive team to a different neighborhood and we knock on doors. We, we see how people are, 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 are living because, you know, that, that elderly grandmother who's, who's got a slumlord uh, that she's renting from and, 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 and she's got buckets on the floor because there are leaks in the roof. That is not coming down to city council to complain, not coming to the mayor's office to complain. We need to get out in the neighborhoods and we need to meet people where they are. We need to see the conditions that they're living in and we need to add value and improvement to their lives uh, uh, on a daily basis. Because why else do you want to be a public servant if you're not out there serving the public? That's, that's what I want to bring to this office. 
Well, thank you. No shortage of passion there. And I love the clarity of the metaphor of the, the pickup truck. Thank you for that. So are we ready to go to questions in the chat? You, you have 15 more minutes. You're, you're, on, you're doing great. So you can still okay. ask questions until 1245. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, talk to us about uh, this. I love the public art and I would love to see more of it. I don't know what other ideas people have, but what are your ideas for increasing um, the community's access to public art? First of all, our city is more than our downtown. Uh, we invest in downtown. I am a resident of downtown, so I appreciate that. That have the downtown. I think of spaces where people. East Chattanooga. We're losing you. Yeah, Marty, um, we're losing. We haven't done. We're losing um, you. Uh, yeah, maybe we start over again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So, so as I, I said, I, our city is more than just downtown. Um, I live downtown and I appreciate the fact that we, we have a great downtown, but we need to invest in public art in neighborhoods where people live and work every day. So when I think of expanding our public art program, I think of investing in art in Alton Park, investing in art in Brainerd, investing in, in East Chattanooga, because I think that when you when you walk down the street of your own neighborhood and you see a beautiful piece of art, then, then that, that adds a, a, a little brightness to your day. And, and I think that we, we need to quit just looking at downtown as, as a show place for, for artistic work. We have, an, we have a big city. We, we, there's room to, to do all kinds of, of things. And, and as I said, we have artists uh, who live in, in various neighborhoods across town. And wouldn't it be great if their neighbors could get to enjoy their own uh, uh, works of art that, that uh, the city had invested in? So, so that is the primary way that I want to expand the public uh, art program. So you've presented a lot of intriguing ideas uh, to us today. Talk about your first 100 days as mayor and uh, talk is cheap. <laughs> Tell us about your first 100 days as mayor and how you are going to mobilize the community so that these ideas uh, become actions. Well, you said talk is cheap. I'm glad you said that um, because I really get tired of listening to candidates who either are, are saying, well, I want, I'm just listening. I'm just listening to you right now. You, uh, you, you just tell me. Uh, no, no, throw some ideas on the table. I also don't like candidates who just speak in platitudes. Uh, you know, art is good. Yes, we, I'm, I'm going to support the, the arts. No, 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 come on people. Let, let's, let, let's put uh, verbs in our sentences here. Let's, uh, let's, let's tell, us, tell everybody what you're gonna do. So you ask me about our first hundred days. Uh, well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make CARTA buses free to ride for all people all the time. Uh, if, you, if you ride uh, the bus every day, one round trip, uh, and we make the buses free to ride, that's putting almost $1,000 a year in your pocket. And, and that's per person. That's not per household. So... Um, so we can greatly improve the uh, quality of life of a lot of people by making Carta free to ride. I also want to reroute the system so that uh, we're putting a bus stop at every middle school and every high school. Right now we have a system that holds our kids hostage to the 215 school bus home every day. And if you go out to the juvenile uh, detention center on Third Street, you will find that the majority of the
afternoon in the evening. They, right, they weren't at it two in the morning. They were still unsupervised and they made some bad decisions. So by get free power of their school, we're allowing them to participate in extracurricular activities. They can play sports. They can be in the school play. They can stay and get extra academic help. So public transit is going to be uh, one of my early, early priorities. I also want to mention uh, public safety. We, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the police department, and I don't like to talk about defunding the police. What I like to talk about is optimizing public safety. Um, there, there are things that I'm sure the police themselves don't want to do that they currently have to do. Why do we send an armed officer to investigate a, a traffic accident? Uh, there are cities like New Orleans that have uh, outsourced uh, traffic accident investigation to, to private companies so that they don't have to send uh, an officer to, to do that. And, you know, why don't we uh, have more social workers to uh, intervene when someone's having a mental health crisis? Um, again, do we need to necessarily send an armed officer to, uh, to take care of those situations? So I want to optimize our police department. I want to sit down uh, with uh, members of the force and members of the community and, and, and really start to address that issue. The third thing that I will give you from my first 100 days is there are African-American owned companies, there are Latinx owned companies, there are women owned companies across our country. Never recruited to go anywhere because they are deemed to be too small by traditional economic development metrics. Suppose we targeted the 100 largest African-American owned companies in America, the 100 largest Latinx owned companies in America, the 100 largest women owned companies in America, and we got a few of them to come to Chattanooga every year. Can you imagine what it would do for the trajectory of East Chattanooga if we put two $200 million African-American owned businesses right in the heart of that neighborhood? Uh, if we did the same thing in, in, in South Chattanooga, uh, I, I think there's, there are incredible things that we can do. We have thousands and thousands of acres in uh, Alton Park in particular that are currently um, brown fields. Uh, we've got to do something to, to address the, the toxins that are that in the land there. And, and one of the things I want to do is create... Um, uh, a, an in, a, a tax increment financing district or TIF so that we can uh, use the incremental tax dollars to clean up some of those areas there so that we can, we can uh, invest in jobs and workplaces that are close to where people live, the, close to the people who need the jobs. So when you ask me about my first 100 days, I'm going to have my track shoes on, Edna. I'm going to be running as hard and as fast as I know how to run because uh, there's a lot to do and I am not going to waste any time. So day one, don't come looking for me in my office because I'm not going to be sitting at the desk. I'm, I'm going to be out working. Awesome. I hear you. You know, lot, uh, thanks to Jamie Mosky, who had already added that question to the chat about uh, making school buses uh, more like car to electric buses, which as we know downtown, they're still free, aren't they? I think they are. Uh, so how are we going to pay for that? That's, that's one of the first questions you know you're going to get. That's a wonderful idea. How are you gonna pay for that? So, so I've, let's talk about school buses. The, the reason that we, we don't um, have more electric school buses is that compared to a city bus, the school bus doesn't travel as many miles. So on a cost per mile basis, it's really hard for the, to make the electric bus uh, pay out. But uh, there are school districts that are partnering with energy companies. Uh, I think Duke Power is a, is a leader in this area. So, so, you know, we really should talk to TVA and, and, and talk to uh, some of our, uh, our corporate citizens about uh, helping to, to make 
uh, uh, electric school buses something uh, that, that would be a reality for us. So you ask how I'm going to pay for, for free CARTA. Right now, CARTA derives only, well, revenue from fares covers 11% of CARTA's operating budget, only 11%. Um, CARTA derives about $3 million a year from uh, from fares. So it's not a huge amount of money that we have to make up. The first thing is that there are about a million dollars uh, of costs that would go away if we did away with fares. Um, the plastic uh, fare cards, uh, the, the expensive software system that has to be leased to manage uh, uh, the system. There are real costs associated with collecting fares. The other thing that, that I would do is right now, uh, parking in downtown Chattanooga is a dollar an hour. It's the cheapest parking in America. You cannot go to Nashville or Knoxville or anywhere else and park for a dollar an hour. We've been spoiled by that. So we need to increase uh, parking to $1.50, uh, a dollar fifty an hour in Chattanooga. Uh, Parking revenues flow through Carta right now. That, that's how the system is currently set up. So by by increasing the the cost of parking and increasing uh, the the revenues from parking, we're we're sending those directly to Carta. Related to that, if I get a parking ticket downtown, uh, it's it's an eleven dollar ticket. Again. It's a very, very inexpensive ticket. I have friends who never put money in the, in the meters downtown. They just wait to get the occasional $11 parking ticket and they just pay it. Uh, that, that small, that, that, that fine is. So we need doing those things uh, more than covers the, the fare that, that we would miss, the revenue that we would miss from the fares. It's easy to do. People say, how are you going to do it? How are you going to pay for it? I mean, this is not calculus. This is, I'm talking about third grade math to, to solve this problem. Okay, so you definitely have your finger on the pulse of some big issues. Transportation, uh, public safety, love hearing your ideas about optimizing uh, the police force, uh, small businesses for women, uh, addressing toxins in land where people are living. Okay, first 100 days, let's hear about your arts priority. <laughs> what are you gonna be doing the first 100 days <laughs> to make sure the arts don't keep slipping down on the priority list? Some of our major venues here, we, we own the Tivoli, we own Memorial Auditorium. So the first thing I'm going to do is institute my $1 for the arts program. So everywhere that we have a venue, I'm, I'm going to ask people, will you contribute a dollar for the arts? That's the first thing that I'm going to do. I, I think that's low hanging fruit. Uh, we can easily uh, make that happen. Uh, the, the, the second thing is I'm going to go to city council and I am going to ask council to um, codify a percent for the arts so that anytime we have development over a, a certain dollar amount that decides. Now, in order to fully enact that program, we're going to have to have a meeting, uh, that summit that I talked about with the arts community, because, you know, what works in Seattle may not work in Chattanooga. And, and so just because it's done one way somewhere else, we don't want to assume that that's how it's going to be done here. Um, the, the, the third thing that I'm going to do in the first 100 days, since, I, as I said, we have a strong mayor form of government. It's the mayor who sets the budget. I'm going to take my pencil and I'm going to change that $250,000 line item for arts build and I'm gonna turn it into a $500,000 line item for arts built um, because we've got to do more work in the neighborhoods. We've got to do more work in the, uh, uh, in the communities through the, the YFD centers. And that is solely within the power of the mayor. And, uh, and as I said, uh, the budget is an expression of a mayor's 
priorities and values. And just because it hasn't been done in the past, just because a mayor hasn't had my priorities, hasn't had my values, that doesn't mean it's not gonna get done in the future. It can easily get done in the future because we're gonna have new priorities and new values. And if the arts are down here right now, well, under Mayor Brule, the arts can go up to here. And so that's what I'm going to do in the first 100 days. Thank you. OK, remember, Mayor Brule, this is recorded. <laughs> so thank you for that. All right, when I got to be a moderator, of, I think Monica and James told me if I wanted to ask a question on my own, I could. You know I'm an educator. And I know the city is not responsible for Hamilton County Schools. I'm an educator, your daughter is a teacher. So what role uh, can the city play, especially when the district is trying to get more of the arts into high poverty schools? In high poverty schools, the arts get cut first, because uh, they may not be considered an essential, but I'm proud of Hamilton County because they realize arts are not the icing on the cake, they're integral. So what role could the city play even though the city is not responsible for public schools? So I have met with uh, Dr. Brian Johnson, um, our superintendent, and I said to, to Dr. Johnson, I said, look, I understand that as the city mayor, I'm not going to be your boss. I'm not going to be able to tell you, uh, you know, how to run the schools. And I don't really want to do that. But just because the law says that the city isn't responsible for public education, it does nothing to lessen or reduce the moral obligation that the mayor of Chattanooga should have to the children of the city. And so as the mayor of Chattanooga, I want to be the very best partner that I can for uh, the, the public schools. You've already heard me talk about how transportation plays a factor. And if we can uh, put bus stops at the schools and make the buses free to ride, then that's adding uh, another tool that kids have to, to be more engaged and to spend more time uh, at school. I also believe that when a child enters middle school, you know, when you've got a sixth grader, someone should sit down with that child and not only ask, what do you want to be when you grow up, but who do you want to be when you grow up? I asked Dr. Johnson if we did that with our kids and he kind of laughed. He said, well, no, we don't do that because we don't have the resources to do that. So as the mayor of, of Chattanooga, I can assign a counselor to every school within the city limits. I have someone sit down with every sixth grader and, and go through that, that questioning and to create a plan to say, look, so you want to be an astronaut. That is great. If you want to be an astronaut, these are the things that you have to do. And if you do these things, then, then you can be successful. Um, I, I want to fuel the, the dreams and aspirations of kids. Peter Thiel is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and he's invested in, in several schools. And, 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 and Peter says that from the time a child is born, you are in a race to, to quickly find out what that kid's passions are and to, and to feed them. Because if a kid is passionate about a, a subject, uh, you, don't, you don't have to say, go do your homework because the kid, the kid will want to do it because it's, it's relating to something that he or she is, is in love with. So, so we've got to identify the passions of our kids. And I, and I think that the, the city can provide additional support to the schools uh, to do that. I also know that, you know, mental health is an issue and that we, you know, we probably can do a better job of providing counseling to, uh, to kids in crisis, identifying those kids and getting them the resources early on that they need. Um, as mayor, I would be willing to invest in that too. Um, so I, I, I don't care whether or not uh, 
Dr. Johnson would report to me as mayor. I just know that I'm going to stand up and, and do the right thing. And I'm going to honor the moral responsibility that I feel uh, for the children of Chattanooga and, and, and I will invest in them. The final thing that I will say about that is I've, I've been in talk with the Pritzker Foundation in Chicago. Uh, the Pritzkers uh, are the founders of Hyatt Hotels and uh, J.B. Pritzker is the current governor of Illinois. But uh, his family foundation is investing in uh, early childhood development all across this country. And their foundation is excited to potentially have the opportunity to come to Chattanooga and use Chattanooga uh, as a pilot program. So I think we can be a model for other cities across the country in early childhood development. And as I said, I'm already talking to the Pritzker Foundation and, and you know, this gets back to the first hundred days. That's going to be one of the first phone calls I make is to Chicago uh, to get their foundation down here so we can see what we can do to help our kids. Thank you. Well, one of the hopes was that people would get to know you a little better. And I certainly think this uh, webinar has helped them know a lot more about you. Um, you mentioned early on that we won't be returning to normal because of the pandemic. Talk about um, the fact that as mayor, you may still be navigating the uh, pandemic. How do you anticipate you will have to operate differently to implement this exciting and ambitious agenda with the looming pandemic? Maybe we won't be dealing with the pandemic by the time you're mayor, but uh, it's good to prepare for it. So talk about uh, becoming mayor in the era of a pandemic. <laughs> so there's good news and there's bad news. So let's, let's start with the good news. The good news is that the fundamentals of our economy have not changed. We were growing uh, at a pretty good clip. Uh, city revenues were growing organically uh, between two and 5% every year pre-pandemic. So we have a robust economy that is still there. It's dormant now, but I believe that it's going to wake up. The, the other good news is that we've got a 70 plus million dollar rainy day fund. And we, we never want to talk about it. We never want to, to draw down on it. Uh, we have a little bit during the pandemic, but if a, pandem if a pandemic doesn't qualify as a rainy day, I don't know what does. I mean, what are we waiting for? So, so I am not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I, I'm, I am going to tap the rainy day fund if I need to, because look outside, people. It is raining. It's pouring. So, 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 so yes, well, I, I think it's good that we, we have that fund that's sitting there. Now let's talk about some of the bad news. There are small business owners. There are people that we all know. And there are employees, people, people who, who one day had a job, who are working, and now they, they don't have a job. So the business is gone. The employees have been laid off. Through, this is through no fault of any individual. We have to give all of these people a clean path back to productivity. We have to work with banks. We have to work with the SBA. We have to work with anybody that we, we, we need to so that, that the fact that that business owner lost his or her business isn't held against them should they want to try to reopen, should they want to, uh, uh, to, to do something else. We've, we've got to say, you know, this is an aberration. Um, we're not going to, you know, fault you as a business owner and, and we want you back. We want you to get back in the game. We want you to open another business and we're going to do all that we can to do that. So, so one of the things that I'm going to create is a small business resource center. 
uh, that will that will be decentralized. Again, you know, you've got to go uh, out where the people are if you're if you're going to reach the people. Um, we've we've got to consolidate resources. We've got to make uh, uh, application processes uh, easy. There's got to be a one-stop shop so that uh, um, that people can um, uh, you know get the help that they need. The 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 third thing that I would say is we have seen how many people in our community. Uh, who live with vulnerability every day. And we've got to make sure that, uh, that we take care of one another. I mean, one of the good things about this pandemic is I have seen Chattanooga stand up to take care of one another in ways that I've never seen before. Um, and I hope that we don't lose that. We don't lose that, that love for one another, that sense of compassion, because that's very, very important. Uh, and, and I, and I want to say this, um, you mentioned that my, my daughter is a teacher. She's a fifth grade teacher school that has a large Latinx population. Um, she, she has kids who come from families where there are undocumented uh, relatives who live in the household. Um, rather than reaching out and, and getting help, they're living in the shadows, living in fear. My daughter has taken food to the homes of some of her students because she knew they didn't have enough to eat. And, and so we've got to make sure that, that, that our city is a safe place for, for every person that we, we don't want to drive people into the shadows. And if they, have, if they have been driven there, if they have been driven there by this pandemic, then we've got to, to turn on the light. We've, we've got to, to give them a path back in and let them know that we love them and that we're gonna take care of them and that we are in fact, one community. So, so when I think about life after the pandemic, I, I, yes, there are going to be challenges. Yes, there are going to be hurdles, but they are not terrible. Um, you know, we, we, we can address this and we will get through it and we will come out better on the other side for sure. I believe we will. Any questions in the chat that I don't yeah. want to uh, no, ma'am. I think I'll take it from here. If, if you have completed all your questions, I'll take the ones out of the Q&A. I think you covered the chat. I, I want to just end by saying thank you so much again. I think the community knows you a lot better after this webinar today. And uh, there's a quote uh, by uh, columnist Cal Tom Thomas that I love. It says, government reflects the soul of its people. And so as our next mayor, I hope you will govern a city that reflects its love of the arts. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. I, I really appreciate your taking the time to, to moderate the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Edna. So we have, we, it looks like we have four questions in the Q&A that we'll go over um, and, we're, and we'll kind of flip back, back to the budget. and. Uh, so we have a question that says, the city uses the budgeting for outcomes, the BFO proposal method for departmental funding. Sports programs and YFD centers are given more consideration than arts programs. What will you do to level the playing field so that the arts are taken more seriously during the BFO process? And then the second part of this question comes in from someone else. It says, what steps will you take to make the bidding process uh, more accessible to local arts organizations? Well, uh, because we have the BFO process today does not mean that we will have the BFO process tomorrow. Um, I think that there are good things about it and there are some, there are some challenges as well. So um, you've already heard me talk about how I'm going to expand uh, investment in the arts and how and where those revenues are, are going to come from. So, so that's the first thing I'm, I'm going uh, to do. Uh, um, we have a human resource problem, I think, in city government when it comes to the arts. Uh, you know, our public, our public arts department is essentially a one person operation. And, and so I, I think we've got a 
have more boots on the ground, if you will, uh, when it when it comes to the arts, because that's going to be a gateway to to expanding the programs is having uh, more touch points and having more conversations. So uh, that that is something that I am, am definitely going to do. I also want to take this opportunity to say that I'm going to invest in participatory budgeting. Um, I don't know how, how much it's going to be because again, we've got to look at, at the impact that, that COVID has had on uh, the city finances. But I can tell you that I am going to take some percentage of the city budget and I am going to allow the citizens themselves to determine how that money is invested. There's an organization in New York called the Participatory Budgeting Proce Project. Um, they work with the New York City Council uh, to, to provide participatory budgeting to the boroughs of, of New York. I have already been talking to the people at the Participatory Budgeting uh, and as mayor, I am going to bring them to Chattanooga and we're going to put some amount of the city budget. It's probably going to be maybe a half million dollars per city council district up to a million dollars. Um, but I believe that the people can be trusted to know what's in their own best interest. And so um, I, I think it's going to be a fun process to teach people how they can can invest this money in their community. It can be invested in the arts. It can be invested in, in economic development. It can be invested any way that the community comes together and says that they want to do it. But I think, I think the BFO process is a little bit of, about how I would uh, interact with my daughter, she would say four or five years old. Um, uh, I would create the illusion of giving her a choice I'd say, oh, do you want to wear this outfit today? Or do you want to wear this outfit today? And trying to distract her from the fact that there was a whole closet full of outfits that she could, uh, that she could choose from, but I was just trying to make it easy for me. And so mm -hmm. I think the BFO process creates the illusion of participation, creates the illusion of having input into um, how the city spends its money. Um, but if you, if you want real input, let's, let's put the money on the table. Let's say to do a community, here is a million dollars for your community. You tell me what you want to do with it. Now, that's a challenge I'm looking forward to going through. It's going to be some exciting times during the Brule administration, I tell you. Well, I tell you what, we're looking forward to it. And as someone um, myself who has participated in the BFO review process two times, I can tell you it is a mess. And as someone who knows um, a lot of the organizations who try to apply for this process is also a mess. And I, I agree. I'm and spending my time. I don't feel like it made quite a difference at all, except for educating me more on the organization. Um, so our next question we have is similar as uh, Mayor Burke restructured, restructured, I'm sorry, city department. When he was elected to office, would you keep the existing structure or do something else? Um, in many cases, we're going to start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, YFD is going to be totally restructured. I can tell you that from Jump Street. Um, there, there are so many uh, things that we can that we can do there. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the YFD centers need to be um, more uh, community oriented. And we currently have a system where each center operates in its own silo. There is amazingly little cooperation between the YFD centers. Uh, uh, we've got to have transportation. So if one YFD center has a great swimming pool, well, why can't the kids from another neighborhood have a van that takes them over to, to utilize that pool? Uh, if, if one center has a great soccer field, why can't kids you know, get in a van mm -hmm. and, and come over and utilize that field? So we've got to totally rethink YFD for sure. That's gonna be something that, uh, uh, that, that I'm gonna address and I'm gonna address it quickly. The, the other thing that I will throw out there is 
um, our parks department, you know, separate from the rec centers is kind of an interesting animal too. Um, we have one set of people who are in uh, the parks department who are in charge of designing and planning our parks. And then we have the people who are in charge of maintaining the parks who are in public works uh, and they don't ever talk to each other. So they're constantly surprising one another uh, when it comes to uh, our parks department. I think it just makes sense that you want to have uh, all of the people in the same uh, department so that they're talking uh, about the, the same priorities. Um, I, I, there's all kinds of low hanging fruit in our government that, that I think can be addressed. And uh, uh, I, I will just end with this novel idea. How about let's talking to the city employees? How about let's trusting the people who are closest to the point of product delivery and, and who understand the issues that combat every single day? And so as, as mayor, I, you know, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking to city workers and finding out how we can improve uh, our, our departments uh, because I know that we can. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Okay, the next is, can we talk about the intersection between art and commerce? What are your plans or strategies to help artists starting out to make their art into a business? Well, I think sometimes uh, the artists themselves don't think about the business side of, of, of art. So I, I, I think that uh, just like we have the company lab and we have the uh, incubator uh, on the North Shore, I, I think that there should be uh, classes for, for people in the arts community to, to, to learn how they can uh, uh, transfer their talents into a viable ongoing business. So, so I think education is, is going to be uh, key there. You've also heard me talk about establishing galleries and neighborhoods throughout our, our community. I, I think the city should invest in studio space across town for artists. I think that, uh, uh, that, that there could be uh, viable, uh, even for-profit galleries that, that are operating. Um, I think in Chattanooga, we tick a lot of boxes. We say, oh yes, we've done this. Oh yes, we've done that. Um, but sometimes we do things without soul. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that we've got to really uh, encourage people, and this, this is where the, the arts communities come into play here. You know, we have soul, we have passion. You know, let's, 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 let's brush our shoulders off. Come on now, let's, let's, let's go out there and, 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 and show the world that, that there's a spirit that, that is in everything that we do. And, and, and I think that, uh, that, that the, the artists and the, uh, the creative talents that we have um, can, can help us define that and can help us, uh, you know, uh, down that path. Uh, and then uh, the, the last thing I will say is something I've already said is, you know, I'm going to expand the dollars that are invested in public arts and I'm going to make sure that, that local um, artists uh, have the ability to, to get commissions from, from our public uh, arts program. Uh, because I, I think putting dollars in the pockets of artists is very important. That's fantastic. Okay, I have one last question for you, sir. Is um, right now, you know, there is a topic about a uh, some funding that the city council is wanting to vote on next Tuesday. Um, and you mentioned earlier in regards to our city-owned venues, how you would like to ask that they contribute a dollar from every event, you know, back to an art budget. How can you, um, you know, we are in a city of creators that has been dubbed by our current administration. And uh, how would you go about making our city owned venues more accessible for our local arts organizations and artists to, uh, to participate and use for their art? I think one of the basic, one of the basic functions of government is to um, assume risk in places where 
uh, it doesn't make sense for individuals or, or businesses to assume that risk. And I think when you look at the publicly owned venues that we have, um, I think they are managed very um, conservatively. I think they, um, they're managed in ways to, to not offend, to, to not uh, press the envelope, if you will. Uh, so, so I think that we have an opportunity to be um, more aggressive in terms of programming, in terms of, of, of opportunity that we provide to artists. I've talked about how we need to change our conventional definition of what art is. Uh, we've got to be open to, to more different kinds of, of, of art that, that exists out there. Um, in, in promoting Nuga as an art committee, uh, you know, to be just like Asheville, I don't have to be just Justin, but I want to version of Chad Nuga as it relates to the arts that we can be. Uh, about the arts, there's little priorities. Plan to put the arts said. You're uh, in my administration has been done in the past. And, and so that's how we're provide uh, economic. That's how we're going to provide economic. We're losing you, Monty. Are we lost him? <laughs> it looks like. I'm, and I told the story. There was one other question, and I apologize. So I will happily, if he doesn't log back on, I'll happily email it to him and get the answer. Oh, here he comes. Can we? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, we lost you there for a moment, but I think we got the, I think we got most of your response on that question. And I actually told you incorrectly, we have one more question that I had missed. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, this comes from Olga Decline. Uh, artists are yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Artists are known problem solvers. Would you consider engaging artists in solving some of the existing problems in the city, such as homeless, people, juvenile delinquency? So I, I have said uh, in, in, in other settings that uh, uh, great design costs the same as, as lousy design. And, uh, and, uh, and we need to, in all aspects of government and all aspects of what we do, We've got to focus on having great design. Uh, uh, it costs too much money to undo uh, bad design. So I love Olga's suggestion that that artists should be included in the broader conversation. Um, I, I I think that uh, uh, the arts community is powerful. And, and I think it should flex its political muscle a little more than it has in the past. And the, the, short, the short answer to Olga's question is yes. Um, uh, I, I would love to get the, the perspective of people from the arts community about a whole host of, of, of issues and, and, and problems. Um, I, I'm probably gonna go somewhere I shouldn't go with this, but you know, we spent, what, $11 million on a redo of Miller Park. Um, and I, I joke and I say, I would have done this for 7 million, uh, you know, but I think that's an example of where we didn't really, you know, seek the best design advice that we could have. I think that nobody wants to talk about it, but we wanted to create a space that was uninhabitable for the homeless. And, and I think they succeeded in that, but they also created a space that was uninhabitable for just about everybody else too. So uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I think that we need uh, to, to have the opinions and the input of more artists uh, in a whole uh, variety of issues. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that, um, you know, no one said being mayor was easy. And so you have to, you have to, you know, jump on these hard topics and you have to be forthright, you know, and have these hard conversations. So 
Um, we appreciate that you're willing to do that. We had one more question come in, and then we're gonna. And we're already 15 minutes over, but there's been great answers, and we just want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Is Jennifer Lewis asked, what can you do about the monopoly that Republic Parking has on the parking? Yes, part of it is cheap, but Republic Parking at night or weekends is impossible in the downtown area and can affect attendance to some art events. So my degree is in economics. And so I talk a lot about incentives. Um, I, the relationship between Republic Parking and the city of Chattanooga is very cozy. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, we're, we're going to have to take a look at that relationship. And, and, and I, I don't have the specifics in mind in, in this particular area. But um, I, I do know that, uh, that parking is an issue. Um, all of those surface parking lots with those impervious service surfaces um, are not good for the environment, not good for sustainability. Uh, so I would, I would want to see a reduction in the amount of our uh, acreage that is devoted to surface parking. Um, but, uh, but other than that, I think all I can say is, is I'm going to open those conversations. I'm going to revisit, you know, all of the agreements that exist between uh, Republic and the city of Chattanooga. And if I were a betting man, I would bet that uh, many of those things are going to change. Okay, that was fantastic news. Well, we truly appreciate all of your time and all of your responses and for you just coming and being forthright with us about, you know, what to expect with your candidacy. Um, I'm going to turn this over to James and uh, for all the thank yous and goodbye. Well, thank I you. just want thank to thank you, Monica. Yes, and I just want to thank you, uh, Monty, um, Edna, a wonderful conversation. Also, Monica, for your partnership and um, involvement with Arts Forward and, and uh, working with Arts Field to help put these series on. So uh, we appreciate you. We have one uh, and some more coming up next week. Uh, we invite you to follow Arts Field's Facebook page and um, all of our social media platforms uh, to stay up to date and to be able to register for these particular webinars. So everyone have a wonderful Friday and have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.